This is not a dog whistle. So what is? What are people telling you that you should think about it? And why am I telling you that you should mostly just put it out of your mind? Well, let's start first things first. What exactly is a dog whistle? Well, a physical dog whistle looks a little something like this. It's a metal tube, you blow into it and it makes a noise. The problem is, is that most people can't hear you. To most people, it just sounds silent. But to dogs, it sounds just like this did. They can hear it, but most people can't. This underlying analogy is the basis of the dog whistle. It is a political concept for a speaker being able to send a message to their in-group, to their chosen audience, while leaving most observers out in the cold, none the wiser as to what he actually means, or in other cases, suspecting what that speaker means, but not being able to demonstrate it because the explicit words, the literal meaning, does not portray the message that the speaker is trying to send. Another term for a dog whistle is implicature. It essentially allows the person to say controversial things without actually having to say controversial things, um, allowing for the meaning to get across with none of the responsibility. Sounds like pretty nasty stuff, right? So understandably, a lot of people are telling you that you really need to care. After all, it's a way for people to secretly send nefarious messages right under our noses. And you know what? They're not all wrong. Dog whistling does exist. There's historical examples of people saying one thing, meaning another, and knowing that that's how it will be understood, or that how it will be affected, or that's the effect that it will have. Uh, my fellow Pangburn co-host, Don Don Prager, had a recent video on dog whistling with a historical sample such as this. Um, in the example, a politician had a racist intent with non-racist wording, and he later admitted what he really meant on tape later, admitting explicitly to his intent. And this is certainly a problem. We certainly wouldn't want people in the public eye to be able to say or contribute such meanings to the, to the discourse with complete impunity, without being able to be confronted in the war of ideas accurately. So why exactly am I telling you that you should probably just ignore it? Well, it's because of actually what the other people are saying. You see, the danger of the dog whistle is that there's no hard evidence to show what the person actually means. That's the whole point. The whole point is that it's veiled, that you can't pin it down, that you can't prove it based on the words alone, it's the design, it's the point, it's what a dog whistle is. And so by its nature then, you could not take the message alone and demonstrate with any level of reasonable certainty that that nefarious message actually exists. Let me give you an example of how hard it is to actually know if somebody's dog whistling. All right, I have a, I have a dog whistle off screen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow it for a second. Or maybe I won't, I don't know. You have to tell me, uh, you have to guess. Ready? Let's go. Okay. Are you sure? Do you know? What if I said something you didn't like politically? What then? Okay, let me try again. How about now? You think I, you think I blew a dog whistle? We're not sure? This is the problem. The whole point of the dog whistle is that there is no actual evidence except in the speaker's mind. Um, it's an intent crime, essentially. It's notoriously difficult to demonstrate. That's, you know, score one for the nefarious dog whistlers, but there comes another problem. Is that that aspect of the dog whistle also puts a point to the people crying dog whistle. Because you see... If the whole point of the accusation is that it's something secret and undetectable that leaves no evidence, well then, there's no difference between accusing a dog whistler of dog whistling and accusing a person just speaking their mind of dog whistling. How to tell the difference? Well, one way is 
get them to admit their intent or provide evidence of their intent. The other way is a much harder case of trying to show a pattern, of trying to show how the message is received, of showing the person speaking intentionally ignoring how it's received or refusing to condemn that particular interpretation and doing it for years and years and years and years and then maybe maybe you have half a case because at the end of the day the there's multiple potential explanations for that pattern of behavior other than his intent i tend to have a pretty high burden of proof about these things i am a staunch believer that we should assume good faith wherever possible unless it's reasonably impossible to do so unless it's been proven to be bad faith beyond a reasonable doubt now many might call this naive and i understand that but i do think it's a misunderstanding what the word naive means naive is an idea of optimism born of ignorance and if i haven't demonstrated this across the course of the video so far i'm sorry but i am not ignorant about what dog whistling is i am well aware that it exists i'm well aware that it probably exists quite a lot right now but the problem is is that i'm also aware that there are many people who aren't dog whistling which is why i assume good faith anyway it's not out of ignorance it's not naivete I'm doing it even though I'm knowing the danger. I could be wrong. I like to think of that as a kind of courage, but you know, maybe I'm being a little self-flattering. And the reason I do that is because the very risk that comes along with dog whistling, the divisiveness that comes with it, the confusion of meaning and language and accurate communication, the hate, the division, the divisiveness, all of that, that danger is equal if not more so in the risk of accusing people who are dog whistling who aren't doing it because that's a me means of demonization of demonizing legitimate concerns by reading in an underlying nefarious meaning or intent now i'm sure i hear you saying but john of course there are some people who are dog whistling you're your standard will let people slip through the cracks yeah it will and our legal system assumes innocent before guilty and we're let guilty people slip through the cracks all the time because we know it's just as big of an injustice for false verdicts and we find freedom just so sacred and it's a similar scenario here i find free speech sacred and I realize that getting it wrong in the other direction is also an injustice as much as letting dog whistling go is as well. And so that's why the dangers of going after it without sufficient evidence to demonstrate it are just as bad, if not worse, than the crime itself. So what do I recommend for you personally? Well, I'm going to borrow a bit of stoic wisdom here. You always have the option of having no opinion. So next time you hear a narrative call a certain policy or concern xenophobic or racist, you don't have to think of it that way. Think of it as nationalistic or patriotic. Or on the other side, you don't have to think of things as crazy or resentful or chaotic. You can think of them as genuine concerns for the downtrodden. You can think of them as empathetic. You can believe that the empathy is pathologized. You can believe that the nationalism or the patriotism is not good in this case that's fine but let's stop with the demonizing labels for no reason let's stop with the assumption of malice when you simply don't have the evidence you know it would be nice you know this is not popular to say on the internet i know we all really like judging each other and assuming everybody who disagrees with us is the worst person in the world i get it i know i'm part of it too i, I don't i try to stop I, I try not to but you know but you don't have to you don't have to be a part of it you don't have to feed into the problem you can take people at their word unless you have a really good reason not to so next time somebody runs up to you grabs you by the arms in the middle of the woods and says don't you hear that blaring dog whistle from that person behind the tree and you look around and you hear nothing you don't have to agree with them you can just shrug and say maybe and keep on walking because if we don't do that we start chopping down every tree 
Even the trees that aren't concealing a bad guy. Maybe we'll get more bad guys. Maybe. But we'll also have a lot more needless destruction. We'll have a lot more rhetorical confusion. We'll have a lot more division. We'll have a lot more paranoia. We'll have a lot more divisiveness. We will have much less true speech. We will be damaging the logos in a very significant way. So, if you think somebody is dog whistling, if you're the one in the woods shaking passerbys, trying to get them to understand the secret message um, that is being uh, silently blown, maybe you're right. Find some evidence. Show me the intent. But until then, let's not assume bad faith. Let's try to keep the war of ideas going without assuming that the person on the other side is cheating. I personally like that standard a hell of a lot better than a constant paranoia about secret nefarious messages in the, pol in the political speech of everybody I don't like. And I think that if everybody adopted this, I think the country would be healthier for it. And again, that's not naivete. That's courage. Because right now we're not doing that. And right now, in terms of our rhetorical situation, things are not good. So, pick your poison. More free speech, more goodwill, more good faith that may be taken advantage of. Or nihilism of the assumption of the bad, of paranoia. I know which one I'm taking. I invite you to join.